Albert and the Tube. In 1922, Albert won a Nobel Prize, the most important award a scientist can ever win, for the thinking he did about the photoelectrical effect. Albert's thinking about the photoelectrical effect then led to the invention of TV. You can thank Albert for the boob tube. An Einstein thought. Albert claimed that space is curved. That's why a ray of light, instead of traveling forever in a straight line, might even return to where it started. Think about it. You're four years old, and while you're out in the yard, you shine a flashlight into the sky. Ten years later, you're fourteen, mowing the lawn, and blam! The same light smacks you in the eyes. Surprise! Chapter Six: War Again. Unless the cause of peace, based on law, gathers behind it the force and zeal of a religion, it hardly can hope to succeed. Albert Einstein. Albert's fame brought him thousands of letters from people all over the world, not just scientists either. Kids, newspaper reporters, political leaders, college students. They all wrote to him. Many of the letters came from Jewish people right in Germany. They were kept out of schools, denied jobs, and not allowed to vote. Albert was Jewish. Couldn't he do anything? For a long time, Albert wanted to help create a homeland for Jewish people. The current Jewish nation of Israel did not exist in the early 1900s. The land where Israel is now was called Palestine. Like many other Jews, Albert thought that this area was where a Jewish homeland belonged. In 1921, Albert traveled with other important Jewish people to the United States. He wanted to raise money for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Albert enjoyed the long boat trip from Europe to America. He looked out at the endless ocean and felt dissolved and immersed in nature. It reminded Albert how tiny one man was compared to the greatness of nature. He was not so important as the world was making him out to be. That thought, he said, makes me happy. So Albert was quite surprised to see thousands of people, including reporters and photographers, waiting at the pier when his ship arrived in New York City. Wherever he went, there were huge crowds eager to see the genius who unlocked secrets of the universe. The mayor of New York personally welcomed him and presented Albert with a key to the city. There was a parade in his honor. When Albert visited Washington D.C., President Warren Harding invited him to the White House. Albert's eccentric genius look was a big hit with Americans. With his wild hair, messy clothes, and friendly personality, Albert charmed reporters. He was often asked. Could you briefly explain your theory of relativity? This question drove Albert nuts. After all, it had taken him 15 years of intense thinking to develop the theory. But he'd take a deep breath, smile, and say, "When a man sits with a pretty girl for an hour, it seems like a minute. But let him sit on a hot stove for a minute, and it's longer than any hour. That's relativity." Although Albert was a superstar in the United States, he was an unwanted problem in Germany. Although he still had his teaching job in Berlin, it became harder for Albert to stay in Germany with each passing year. After the Nazis took control of Germany in the 1930s, Albert's life was increasingly in danger. Nazis hated Jews, intellectuals, and pacifists. Albert was all three. When Nazis emptied university libraries of all their books and burned them, it was often Albert's books that topped the huge bonfires. By 1930, Albert had done most of his best scientific thinking. His focus now was on politics and public speaking. This made the Nazis even angrier. 
For his safety, Elsa pleaded with Albert to stop speaking out against the Nazis. He refused. He said, I wouldn't be Einstein if I kept quiet. He also refused to leave Germany, even though more and more friends and family begged him to. The Einsteins did, however, take many trips to more welcoming countries. They traveled to the Middle East, to Asia, and to the west coast of the United States. Everywhere they went, they were greeted by large, cheering crowds. Japan even declared the day of Albert's arrival there a national holiday. In Spain, he was greeted by the king and thousands of fans. Albert received honorary degrees from Oxford, Cambridge, the Sorbonne, Harvard, and many other universities around the world. He was a guest professor, raised funds for Jewish causes, and warned of the growing political hatred in Germany. How strange for Albert to be adored all over the world, except in the country where he had been born. The Nazis published a book called 100 Authors Against Einstein. All Albert said was, Why 100? If I were wrong, one would have been enough. Albert was very lucky to have survived in Nazi Germany. In 1931, while Albert was a guest professor in California, Adolf Hitler declared Albert a spy. Hitler put out a death warrant for Albert. In 1933, while Albert and Elsa were returning home from their trip to California, Nazis broke into Einstein's summer house in Kaputh, Germany. A bread knife was found in the kitchen, a perfectly natural place for a bread knife to be. But the Nazis used the knife as proof of what a dangerous man Albert was. The Nazis seized everything Albert owned his home and his money. Now there was no question about moving. Albert and Elsa rented a house in Belgium where Albert's stepdaughters also came to live. But in Belgium, a new book from Germany was now available. It included photographs of Nazi enemies. Albert's photo was on the very first page with the words, Not yet hanged, printed next to it. Belgium was not a safe place to stay either. But where would the Einsteins go? England? No. Elsa was afraid to live there. In England, the Nazis had offered a huge reward for Albert's murder. Albert joked, I never knew that I was worth so much. In the end, Albert and Elsa decided that the United States would be their new home. Albert became a professor of mathematics at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Albert asked for a salary of $3,000. Elsa got that up to $16,000. By the end of 1933, he and Elsa had settled into the small college town. The early years in Princeton were very difficult. Albert was 54 years old. He was not a young man. He was no longer startling the world with new ideas. Then, just three years after their move to Princeton, Elsa passed away. Albert was lonely and heartbroken. His own health suffered. He had barely left Elsa's side for the last 12 months of her life. Albert also kept hearing about friends who had been murdered in Germany. With all of the energy that he had left, he was determined to do whatever he could to stop the Nazis. He played the violin at fundraising concerts, but that was not going to put an end to Hitler. Albert's famous equation. E equals mc squared said that if just a few atoms were converted to energy, the amount of energy produced would be massive. In 1939, Albert learned that European scientists were at work trying to make an atomic bomb. Albert feared what the Germans would do if they were the first to build such a bomb. So Albert wrote a letter to the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. He asked that the United States begin developing an atomic bomb right away. This could not have been an easy letter for a man like Albert to write. He hated war, he hated weapons. Yet now he was asking the United States to hurry up and build the most destructive bomb ever imagined. 
Even the simplest atomic bomb could destroy an entire city and kill thousands of people within seconds. But Albert thought that it would be worse if the Nazis were the only ones with such a weapon. Partly because of Albert's letter, President Roosevelt had secret work begun on building an atomic bomb. Albert later reflected on this moment in world history. I made one great mistake in my life. When I signed the letter to President Roosevelt recommending that atom bombs be made, but there was some justification, the danger that the Germans would make them. After World War II, Albert spent time and energy trying to limit the development of atomic weapons. I do not know how the Third World War will be fought, he warned, but I do know how the Fourth will, with sticks and stones. What he meant was that after a Third World War with atomic bombs, the modern world would be destroyed and humans would have to go back to living like cavemen. We scientists, Albert said, must consider it our solemn duty to do all in our power in preventing these weapons from being used. Even today, some people blame Einstein for the atom bomb because he discovered the relationship between mass and energy. But can anybody blame Isaac Newton, who first explained the laws of gravity for every plane that crashes to the ground? In 1940, at age 61, Albert became a citizen of the United States. For the rest of his life, he remained in Princeton, New Jersey, and worked on something called the Unified Field Theory. But surprisingly, Albert never produced a finished theory. In many ways, Albert's life had come full circle. Toward the end of his life, he wrote, I am generally regarded as a sort of petrified object, rendered deaf and blind by the years. He loved to take walks, just as he always had. And although Albert never drove a car, he loved to sail. He would take out a one-engine boat, aim it at other boats, and then, at the last moment, swerve aside. In Princeton, he was a familiar sight, walking back and forth between his home and office, often chatting with neighbors. He spoke English with an accent. I think I will a little study. She is a very good theory. His shaggy hair, now white, grew even wilder, and he often went without socks, belt, or suspenders. Once, some boys asked Albert why he never wore socks. With a sly smile, he answered that he was now old enough that if he didn't want to, he didn't have to. On his walks, Albert was known to stop and help a child fix a bicycle. And when a young girl came to his house asking for help with her math homework, Albert not only did just that, but shared his lunch of a can of baked beans with her. As for his own children, Albert rarely saw his sons. Hans Albert had fled Nazi Germany and later moved to California. Edward and Maliva remained safe in Switzerland, where Maliva died in 1948. Albert's sister and best friend Maya came to live with him in Princeton. As a child, Albert had a horrible temper that once led him to hit Maya in the head. In these later years, she'd smile and say, To be the sister of a thinker, you must have a very thick skull. Life in Princeton was pleasant. In the evenings, just as Albert and his mother used to play duets, he played violin with other musicians. He ended up spending the last 20 years of his life at his house at 112 Mercer Street in Princeton. He loved the old house, its gardens, and the way the light came through the windows. When they first moved to Mercer Street, Elsa had a picture window put in Albert's study. From there, Albert could enjoy the beauty and mystery of nature as he always had, watching birds fly, flowers bloom, and the morning sunrise. Hitler and the Nazis Germany could not recover from their defeat in World War I. The treaty that ended the war left Germans hungry, poor, and feeling hopeless. The Nazis, National Socialist Party, blamed Germany's problems on people of the Jewish religion. 
By the early 1930s, the Nazi Party had grown from a small band of people with extremely dangerous ideas to the most powerful political party in Germany. The Nazis were led by Adolf Hitler, who became Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Hitler's government denied Jews a normal life. They could not go to school, hold jobs, own property, or worship. Eventually, the Nazis began murdering the Jews. They wanted to wipe every Jew off the face of the earth. The Nazis killed six million Jews before World War II ended in 1945, and Germany was defeated. The Atomic Bomb. In World War II, Japan joined forces with Germany and Italy. So now there were two fronts or areas of battle: Europe and the islands in the Pacific Ocean. In late 1941, the United States joined the countries England, France in the fight against Germany and Japan. American troops were sent to both battlefronts. At 8:15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, an American military plane released an atomic bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. In an instant, 80,000 people were killed. Hiroshima simply ceased to exist. People at the blast center were vaporized. All that remained was their charred shadows on the walls of buildings. Three days later, the U.S. dropped another bomb on another Japanese city, Nagasaki. Japan soon surrendered, and World War II finally came to an end. The world now had weapons that were destructive beyond imagination. Decades of scientific thought and research, including Einstein's, made the atomic bomb a possibility. War made it a reality. The world was never the same again. Chapter Seven: Albert's time is up. Everything is determined, the beginning as well as the end, by forces over which we have no control. It is determined for the insect as well as for the star, human beings. Vegetables or cosmic dust, we all dance to a mysterious tune, intoned in the distance by an invisible player. Albert Einstein. By 1948, Albert was in very poor health. His heart was getting weaker and weaker. A doctor insisted that Albert take a certain medicine. Albert hesitated. The doctor insisted. So Albert took the medicine and immediately got sick to his stomach. There, he snapped at the doctor. Do you feel better now? Yet there was reason for happiness during those years. In 1948, the Jewish nation of Israel was created. Albert was overjoyed. All his work had helped to bring about something wonderful. After Israel's first president died, Albert was asked to become the next president. Albert said no. Politics is for the moment, he once wrote, while an equation is for eternity. Still, he was greatly honored by the offer. In 1950, Albert made his will. He wanted all his science papers left to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In 1951, Maya died. Now Albert had neither his wife nor sister. He was more alone than ever. He surrounded himself with family photographs. He said, "A photograph never grows old. You and I change. People change all through the months and years, but a photograph always remains the same. How nice to look at a photograph of a mother or father taken many years ago. You see them as you remember them. That is why I think a photograph can be kind." Several years later, after a brief illness. Albert was admitted to the Princeton Hospital. On April seventeenth, nineteen fifty-five, he asked that his eyeglasses, some paper, and a pen be brought to his hospital bed. He had work, thinking to do. The next day, he died with a sheet of equations next to him. 
to the very end, Albert was thinking. The last letter he wrote was one that urged all nations to give up nuclear weapons. The Einstein House at 112 Mercer Street in Princeton, New Jersey, is treated no differently than any other home in the neighborhood. That's the way Albert wanted it. He worried that if it was turned into a museum, people would concern themselves too much with his memory and not enough with their own future. After Albert's death, the scientific community mourned the loss of a great and original mind. Jews mourned the loss of a leader who always wished for a better and more peaceful world, even in the darkest moments of Jewish history. And all people mourned the loss of a unique, peace-loving man. Perhaps Albert said it best, only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. Albert was not the best husband. He was not the best father. But as a friend said of Albert, he was the freest man I have known. Chapter 8. A Final Thought Albert left these instructions upon his death. Donate my brain to science, cremate my body, and throw the ashes in some secret place. This was done. So where is Albert's brain now? After Albert died, an autopsy was done on his body. In the process, the doctor, Thomas Harvey, removed Albert's brain studied it, decided that there was nothing all that special about it, and set it aside in a bottle of formaldehyde. Later, when Dr. Harvey moved to Wichita, Kansas, he took the brain with him. He kept the brain, which was in pieces, in two jars inside a cardboard box labeled cider. Since then, further studies by several medical researchers have found Albert's brain to be a bit more interesting than Dr. Harvey did. Dr. Harvey provided the researchers with pieces of the brain. Albert's brain weighed less than the average brain, was 50% wider, and had an unusual set of grooves. Yet the importance of these differences remains unknown. Harvey kept the brain with him for over 40 years. One time, Harvey and Michael Paterniti, an author, put the brain in the trunk of a car and drove it all the way to California so that a piece of it could be given to Albert's granddaughter, Evelyn. Soon after that trip, Harvey turned the brain over to a Princeton hospital, where it continues to float around in a jar. You have to wonder what Albert would think of that. Timeline of Albert's Life 1879, Albert is born March 14th in Germany. 1881, Albert's sister Maya is born. 1889, Albert starts high school. 1894, Albert's family moves to Italy, leaving him in school in Germany. 1899, Albert decides to become a Swiss citizen. 1900, Albert graduates from college. 1902, Albert gets a job at the patent office. 1903, Albert marries Maliva Meritz. 1905, Albert introduces his theory of relativity. 1909, Albert becomes a professor at the University of Zurich. 1914, Albert leaves Maliva and his sons and moves to Berlin, Germany. Albert must wait to prove his theory of curving light. 1919. Albert marries Elsa. 1921. Albert visits the United States. 1922. Albert wins the Nobel Prize for Physics. 1931. Albert is declared a spy. Hitler puts out a death warrant for him. 1933. Albert and Elsa move to Princeton, New Jersey. 1936. Death of Elsa. 1940. Albert becomes a U.S. citizen. 1948. Death of Maliva. 1951. Albert's sister Maya dies. 1955. 
Albert dies on April 18th. Timeline of the World 1879. Thomas Edison invents the light bulb. 1881. Clara Barton founds the American Red Cross. 1889. The Eiffel Tower is completed in Paris. Vincent van Gogh paints The Starry Night. 1894. X rays are discovered. 1895. The first movie is shown in Paris. 1895. 1899. The first modern Olympics are held in Greece. 1896. 1900. Dr. Sigmund Freud publishes The Interpretation of Dreams. 1902. The first Tyrannosaurus rex fossil is discovered. 1903. The Wright brothers fly the first plane. 1905. The first movie theater opens. 1909. American Robert Perry reaches the North Pole. 1914. The Titanic sinks. 1912. The first crossword puzzle appears in a New York newspaper. 1913. Outbreak of World War I. 1919. World War I ends. 1918. 1921. The first highway opens in Germany. 1922. King Tut's tomb is found. 1931. The Star Spangled Banner becomes the U.S. national anthem. 1933. Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. 1936. Franklin D. Roosevelt is re elected president. The game Monopoly is invented. 1940. Outbreak of World War II. 1939. 1948. World War II ends. 1945. FDR dies and Harry Truman becomes president. 1945. The nation of Israel is created. 1951. The phrase rock and roll is used on the radio for the first time. I Love Lucy premieres on TV. 1955. Disneyland opens in California.